Today I want to look at Exodus, uh, the passage, and particularly, Karen, thank you for lifting up this. I join with my sisters and brothers of faith in Judaism across the globe today in looking at the text of the Ten Commandments. I also join, I hope, all of you and everyone everywhere lifting up the people of Israel and Palestine who are embattled in a terrible struggle this morning. Um, I read in the New York Times this morning that we in the United States need to see what has happened in Israel as their 9-11. This is very significant. So will you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Looking at our Hebrew scripture text from Exodus 20, generally referred to as the Ten Commandments, and writing in the Christian century, pastor, theologian, and author Liz Coolidge Jenkins poses a critical question. How do we build something different? She continues, many of us find ourselves asking this question it has been, become clear that current structures, systems, mindsets, practices, and theologies are not working, and we want to make a change. But too often we unintentionally rebuild different looking versions of the same broken systems, the same corrupt hierarchies. We recognize that we need deeper change, but we are not always sure what to do with this recognition. Audre Lorde famously wrote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. How do we bring new tools into play, tools that, in Lord's words, enable us to bring about genuine change? I imagine the Israelites wrestling with questions like these as they wandered in the desert. It was a liminal space, no longer in Egypt, but not yet in the Promised Land no longer eating the food of Pharaoh, but not yet farming and herding themselves. And in the meantime, subsisting on God's miraculously provided water, quail, and manna. No longer forcibly subject, subjected to Egyptian laws, but not yet having laws of their own. No longer enslaved, but not yet sure exactly what freedom looks like. Then, in this uncertain, murky time, God gives the people a gift, 10 laws. In a lecture on the Ten Commandments to Bethany Lutheran Church in Ishpening, Michigan, in October of 2007, Dr. Walter Brueggemann referred to these 10 laws as guidelines for a constructive neighborhood. He says the first three commandments are the, those that help us face the anxiety that we carry and teach us that God is good. God is reasonable. These laws are all about adding God's support to our projects. And because God is holy, we can't abuse these gifts or this trust. He says the second set of six teach people that the only thing to break the power of anxiety is enormous abundance. Generosity overwhelms anxiety every time. Neighbors are entitled to ultimate respect and neighbors are to be honored. And finally, he writes the 10th commandment, God requires people to serve one another. This establishes uh, a chance for people to prevent abusing one another. So God offers these. In, the, in his book, The Journey to the Common Good, he summarizes this a little differently, but he says this, first, Love and trust of Yahweh rather than the Pharaoh's security system is found in the first three commandments. Second, we embrace the Sabbath rest as an alternative to aggressive anxiety. And third, we recognize that neighbors, all kinds of neighbors, are to be respected and protected and not exploited. And finally, he says, we limit acquisitiveness particularly predatory practices and aggressive policies that make the little ones vulnerable to the ambitions of the big ones. So the 10 laws are all about God's teaching, God's community of faith, how to live with one another and with neighbors. Remember, the people of Israel 
have been brutalized, dehumanized for more than 400 years when these words come. And so even as God liberates them, God also affirms their humanity and invites them into ways of being that continually affirm one another's humanity and those all around them in the community that they're coming to know. God calls them to rehumanize one another by trusting God to provide abundantly for all, by respecting one another, by resting, by being con content with one another, by refusing to kill or steal or cheat or lie. Many years later, the psalmist will sing, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul, in Psalm 19:7, For souls wounded from 400 years of collective trauma and likely wondering what healing might look like, I imagine God's law is feeling a lot like the balm of Gilead. These refreshing communally-oriented commandments the gift of guidance from a God who shows people over and over again that they are not abandoned, do not decrease the agency of people to lose honoring one another. It happens nevertheless, right? These are not decrees, though. These don't come from on high. They're not demanding mindless submission. They are not moralizing standards that are meant to cause division between those folks who are perfectly fine and everyone else who the perfectly fine look down on. They are guidelines for human flourishing, given by God who says, as a way of preparing the people to receive the commandments, I carried you on eagle's wings. I brought you to myself. It's found in Exodus 19, just the chapter before a God who wants the people to be God's own treasured possessions in 19.5, a God who empowers the recently enslaved desert wanderers to become a kingdom of priests and a holy nation in Exodus 19.6. Today, God's laws not only serve as a guideline for holistic, transformative human flourishing, but they also help us to discern how to engage with others and all sorts of authorities. Desmond Tutu saw this clearly in his anti-apartheid activism. He wrote, when a clash occurs between the laws of man and the laws of God, then for Christians there can be no debate or argument about which they must obey. He goes on to urge, please let us be mindful of the important distinction between what is legal and what is right in the moral sense of God. Amen. A clash. In case you're not aware, we're engaged in a clash, a constitutional clash here in Ohio. And in this clash, I'm calling everyone to show up and state where you stand. I'm calling everyone to vote on or before November 7th as part of resolving this clash. At the heart of it all, we are being called by issue one on the ballot to decide whether or not women, people, families have the right to decide what they will do and how they will act in relation to their pregnancies, their bodies, and themselves. Currently, the Ohio laws put in place since Dodds overturned Roe v. Wade in the Supreme Court are highly restrict restrictive laws. If you are raped, no matter what age or condition, if you have an unwanted pregnancy, if you have a medically dangerous or questionably viable pregnancy, or even if you have miscarried, you must carry to term the pregnancy within you under all conditions. That's the law of Ohio. I believe Ohio's current laws are inhumane and unjust. I believe the government has no place deciding for you how such troubling pregnancies should go. And I believe these decisions should be the decisions of the person facing them in the toughest, most troubling circumstances, no matter what the conditions are. To honor these beliefs, I am choosing to vote yes on issue one, and I hope that that will help us form constitutional grace. Now, some of you may be aware this is dear to my heart. 
You may also know that I have been featured in a 30-second ad that has run statewide for the past four days on all sorts of networks and networks and platforms everywhere. In the ad in 30 seconds, I say what I believe, beliefs that have been formed out of 38 years of pastoral experience with families facing really difficult decisions. The ad was sent to you yesterday so you could see what it says, and I'm grateful for the support from many of you. My favorite of all came from my dog groomer, who when he said, are you the guy on the ad? And I said, yes, I wasn't sure what he would say next. And he said, great, I can't wait to see the boys. <laughs> so, but mostly for the last four days, I have taken an unrelenting pounding from the religious right and self-identified Catholics. I have been called many names, and even this morning had calls and emails add to that. I've had scripture quoted to me about the fact that I am a horrible person and a horrible faith leader and more. In more than 46 negative communications, I have been told that I am no longer worthy of being called a reverend because I'm a baby killer. I have been told that I'm going to hell. I have been told that I hate all babies and that God will judge me and send me to hell for supporting women's reproductive rights. Now, I've read each communication, maybe I shouldn't, and I've taken stock in their concerns. All of their hate and vitriol is pointed at me, all of it in the name of God. I want to be clear about something. There is no one here nor this building that is, has been threatened in any way. No threats to you or the building. The threats have come to me. Let me share a few thoughts before wrapping up and sitting down. First of all, I am the only Ohio religious leader in these ads. I feel alone in this effort. While I know that millions of Ohioans, including those who are here as well, not all, but some, hopefully um, will vote on November 7th. I also know that as the only faith leader in the ads, I have a special target on me. This is particularly hard at all sorts of hours of the day and night. Second, it is clear that the God I worship is different than the God that these critics worship. I believe God stands with pregnant women and their loved ones through everything. And when they struggle over critical decisions through all stages of pregnancy, I believe that God is there. I also believe that this is not for any government to decide. It is for the people who are intimately, purposely, spiritually, prayerfully, and thoughtfully struggling with the decisions to decide case by case. Third, I find tremendous comfort and solace, Karen, deep in the thoughts and reflections of 5784, 50, 5,784 years of Jewish tradition and faith. In Jewish tradition, two truths have survived through thousands of years. The first, that the pregnant person's life takes precedence over the fetus. Second, every case is dealt with on its own merit case by case. Jewish law cares about the diversity of experience, and just as every person was created in the divine image, image, so every pregnancy is regarded as totally unique in itself. This is part of the halakhic tradition of Judaism, the Jewish legal term for how a mother's life is handled. And it literally translates that the suffering of the pregnant person's body comes first. It is exactly this writing which issue one calls for and acknowledges. By passing this issue, we acknowledge that our Constitution supports women who suffer through difficult pregnancies. Rabbi David Feldman explains it this way, the fetus is unknown, future, potential, part of the secrets of God. The mother is known, present, alive, and asking for compassion. Therefore, while the fetus's condition is highly regarded and tremendously supported, the pres pregnant person's needs are central in any question related to this law in Judaism. 
Every single case is, divided individu is decided individually. Out of the 46 negative outside emails and calls I have received from outside the church and my relationship circles, I have received one positive email, one. And so I want you to hear this one singular voice who makes everything else that I've done worthwhile in my entire ministry. Listen for this voice coming from a rural Ohioan whose name I will not use in order to protect her. Her voice inspires me to keep fighting for reproductive rights. She writes, thank you for standing up and speaking out for reproductive rights, not only for women, but all touched by these decisions. It is true, authentic love for one another when we can see past our passions to a place of empathy and kindness. I feel so many people do not understand the need for this law. I was 11 when I was raped, and I didn't get pregnant. If I had, it would have been devastating. Myself and so many females in Appalachia were sexually abused by family, friends, men of power. We were able to secretly get the birth control pill, and some got abortions. Unfortunately, this abuse goes on today, still goes on today. To force these women and girls to carry a child to birth is cruel. It is also an enormous financial burden in an already poverty-stricken area. I have family members that did have the babies, they were unwanted, and they became victims of abuse too. Many, so many, became abusers. So I am grateful you spoke up. I feel relieved that someone finally said this must end. Showing people any act of kindness is an act of love and will change the world to peace. Bless you. God prioritizes two key values in Exodus 20, to honor God and to love our neighbor. Do not dishonor God's image in your neighbor. If human-made laws are racist or misogynistic or otherwise unjust, such that they cannot be followed while honoring God's image in every human being, then they contradict God's laws and have no claim over us as people of faith. In that sense, God's laws offer a kind of freedom. Earthly laws that contradict our higher law do not contain us. We can resist when we need to. We can struggle together for a better world. In doing so, we can find ourselves building new tools. In the world, we can build a world of generosity. In a competitive world, we can build communal mindedness. In a rushed and impatient world, we can build space to rest. In a world where wealth is unjustly distributed, those who have resources refuse to try to gain more and more, and instead they open their hands to share with those who do not have enough. In doing these things, like the Israelites learning how to live out of a brand new liberation, we will become truly free. Today we face some constitutional questions and decisions as a community of faith. In these changes, we must ask, are we building something different? And how will we practice constitutional grace as we seek to live generously in community? And finally, how will we follow and incorporate God's 10 laws, which are truly guidelines for human flourishing? Amen.